Hey, you guys. Um, I'm going to try to not stay on here too long. You guys are so beautiful. I, I just have to say that. And I actually came up, I plan to do a live today on accessing whiteness. Um, I think I'm going to do that a little later tonight. But before I do anything else, I was very inspired by a comment that one of you left. And I just have to say that I really appreciate when you guys are bold and honest because there's so many conversations that we have to have as a people. And um, a lot of them are uncomfortable conversations. So I just wanna start with the comment that kind of provoked this live. It was left by Kenya from Cali. And I want to speak on the response that she got. And I want to explain why she was really on point, even though her honesty made some of us feel uncomfortable. Do you know what I'm saying? So um, Kenny from Cali said, and this was in our conversation about let's have a non YouTube talk, the live I did yesterday. And she was saying in reference to my comment, which was inspired by something that Cynthia had said on her live about the breeding of temperament. And that provoked me to go do research into slave breeding practices, which I'm still doing, y'all. And it's very fascinating when you look into slave breeding practices and how certain temperaments and body types and things like that were literally bred into Black people. And that accounts a lot for our um, behavior now, obviously, with some environmental impact. But hi, Curtis. Hi, Cherise. Hi, Black Caesar. So Kenya from Kelly made this comment. She said, I had an epiphany about four years ago. I was driving through a rundown ghetto, quotes, she put that in quotes, part of Atlanta. As I observed our people hanging out at the corner store, selling all manner of illicit drugs to their neighbors, dropping food bags and chicken bones onto, onto the ground as they walked. As I watched some middle-aged brothers sit and squander on the stoops of an abandoned home as I watched black men and women's bodies riddled with all matter of disease and trauma. I realized that there was in fact dissimilarity between me and the despair I was seeing. In our recent history, some of us have literally been bred to be comfortable living like animals, like literally bred with the runt of the litter for specific purposes that were beyond my knowing. None of this is an accident. And um, Shawat 2013 said, nothing seems condescending here. And Kenya from Kelly did respond and I also responded, but the beef of my response, I'm gonna address here um, during this live. And I really hope I'm not cutting out. Hey, Kevin, I really hope I'm not cutting out because this is really important to me. I can't even lie. Um, so, I want to just take what Kenya from Cali said, and Kenya, you don't know how on point you are. You are so on point, Kenya. I want to take what you said, and I want to refer to a book in my book collection called The Bond Woman's Narrative. And The Bond Woman's Narrative was written by a woman named Hannah Crafts. Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, edited uh, this collection of writings by her. And um, this is believed to have been wrote in the mid 19th century. Uh, Hannah Craft professed herself to be a slave of mulatto origin. And um, the book was authenticated prior to printing as far as the date. And I'm still waiting on word to see if the book was authenticated as far as if there was a slave named Hannah Craft. So with that said, I want to read an excerpt from this book because the excerpt in this book literally speaks to exactly what Kenya said. Now, remember, Hannah Craft was a mulatto. She was sold back and forth as a sexual slave and as a mistress 
to white women because we know the female mulatto class, quadroon, octoroon class were often used for sex and female companionship um, for white women. And so she was bred one way. And in part of the book, because she had spent time on a plantation where slaves were treated relatively quote unquote well, and then she was sold onto a plantation where the field slaves were treated like crap. And she goes on to describe what it was like for those field slaves. And I want you to compare what Hannah Craft, who was a form who was a slave, wrote about what she saw to what I just said that Kenya from Cali saw. Because I think this is significant. When I read what Kenya wrote, Kenya, you literally made me think of this book. Your words were literally a repetition of an actual slave's account of what the lowest of the lowest slaves, the field slaves that were worked the hardest, what their environment was like. And I think, you know, these comfort. But y'all have to have them. I think it's necessary. So let's just, let's go there. Let's read a firsthand account of what it was like for the slaves that were bred to do the hard work. Somebody said Kenya from Cali's comment seemed condescending, but I say her comment was real. It was real. It's just a lot of these real, these real conversations make us uncomfortable. Um, and Jamaican... Um, it's not about our degenerates being worse than other people's degenerates. It's not even about that. Um, it's just about recognizing that black people were part of a type of slavery where we were literally bred a certain way. And like I said, since Sin brought this up on her channel, I have been researching um, slave breeding practices slave breeding practices. And it is a fact that certain uh, personality types and certain body types were specifically bred for hundreds of years in this country. That's an uncomfortable thing to say as a black woman. And it may be an uncomfortable thing to hear, but it is important for us to acknowledge this and that this could have something to do if you bred a slave for sex, if you bred a slave for work, if you bred a slave to be docile, and that went on for hundreds of years, that could have some relevancy to us today. So it's not a, it doesn't make us feel good to have these conversations, but I just wanna go into a document that was verified as being a true historical document. And I just wanna read to you guys a firsthand account of the slaves that were bred to work. And this was written by a slave. And I just want you guys to hear what she says. So um, she said, in the distance was a cotton field with the snowy fleece bursting richly from the pod. Now remember, this is an educated slave because she was meant to be a companion either to white men or she was bred to be a companion to white women. And in the many times that she was sold, the many times that this slave was sold, she had been both sold for sex and sold for companionship to a white mistress. So she was bred one way, right? And now she is going to a plantation where there are a lot of field slaves and they were bred for nothing but brute work. And she goes to talk about what she saw there, which was horrifying to her because her privilege of being bred for to be a companion had hid from her the reality of what it was for the other slaves that were not bred like her. And this is going to be highly offensive, but I want you guys to listen to what she says, okay? So again, I'm reading this from the Bond Woman's Narrative written by um, Hannah Crafts. Uh, this book was authenticated. Um, it's not a book. It was a collection of writings by her. It was authenticated to have been written in the mid-19th century 
people are still trying to authenticate and find the actual slave that wrote it. And Henry Louis Gates Jr. edited the book, but he left in all of her original um, uh, edits. So anyway, it says, in the distance was a cotton field with a snowy fleece bursting richly from the pod and sweeping down to the river's edge was a large plantation of rice. Of course, the labor of many slaves was required to keep such a large estate in thrifty order. The huts of these people were ragged on the backside of the place and far from the habitation of their master as possible. So the huts were ragged and they were pushed far away from the, the main plantation house. They were built with far less reverence to the neatness and convenience than those in Virginia. They had not. so. The Virginia slaves had patches of gardens to grow their food, the slave plantation that she was originally from. So she's doing a compare and contrast from the plantation that she was on to this new plantation where she had been sold. And look at what she says the difference was. She says, they had not the little garden patch, the tiny yard with its bright flowers or the comfortable home aspect of whitewashed walls. These slave huts were more crowded. There was not that division of families I had been accustomed to see. So in her old plantation, the slaves had gardens. They were allowed to grow flowers in front of their homes. They had whitewashed walls and the families were kept together in separate huts. In this new plantation, they did not divide the families and the huts were broken down and worn down. She goes on to say they were crowded. There was not that division of families I had been accustomed to see, but they all lived promiscuously, anyhow and everyhow. And she does mean that in the sexual sense. They were crowded into tiny huts, but they were heavily promiscuous with each other. At least they did not die, which was a wonder. She's saying the condition was so bad, it is a miracle these people were not dead. She goes on to say, it is a stretch of the imagination to say that by night they, con they contained a swarm of misery, that crowds of foul existence crawled in and out of gaps in walls and boards or coiled themselves to sleep on nauseous heaps of straw, fatigued with human perspiration, and where the rain drips in. These people slept on straw with the bugs crawling through it, she said. They sweated and they slept on this filthy straw in huts that were crowded with people having sex with bugs and nastiness. And she's comparing this to what she had experienced at her previous plantation. She says, and the damp airs of midnight fetch and carry malignant fevers. Let me keep reading, because I know this makes us uncomfortable, but this is a firsthand slave account. And this is very much what Kenya from Cali was describing. But Kenya did not know how on point she was. When I read Kenya's comment, I thought about this book that I have in my collection. It made me think of this passage because I have never forgotten this passage painted such a clear picture for me. They said that many of these huts were old and ruinous with decay that occasionally a crash and a crowd of dust would be perceived among them and that each time it was occasioned by the fall of one. But lodgings are found among that rubbish and all goes on as before. Everything is in disrepair, it's falling down, but the people just keep on living in it, like nothing is going on. And that is what Kenya from Kelly described in her comment under my video, as far as what she observed when she was in the quote unquote ghetto. And it made her think, is there something to us being bred to accept a certain condition? She goes on to say, and remember, I'm reading a firsthand slave's account. She said, since if the head gets bruised, since if a head gets bruised or a limb broken, head and limbs are so plentiful that they seem of small account. 
She's saying that these slaves would be injured or an arm or a leg on them would be broken, but they had so many filled slaves, nobody cared. Nobody cared about these people. She goes on to say, so true it is that if a great man sneezes, the world rings with it. But if a poor man dies, no one sees or cares. And she goes on and on to discuss, to discuss how this experience, because remember, she was bred as a companion. She was bred on a plantation where the slaves were treated with some humanity. But then when she entered into this new plantation and left Virginia, they had a plantation that was heavy with nothing but slaves that were designed to work in rice fields. And she is describing the condition of those slaves. Now, I want you to think about what I just read, and I want you to compare it to the comment that was left by Kenya from Cali. Okay? That was the first hand account from a slave about what she saw. And then we have Kenya from Cali. Let me see if I can pull up her comment because her comment was so profound. Literally, her comment made me have to go live. Not just her comment, but also the reaction to her comment, which was people were offended that she had the nerve to say it. But we have to have these conversations. We have to have these conversations. Oh my gosh, Kenya, like, is it literally possible that so many people have commented at this point that I cannot find your comment. I'm like mad perturbed. Okay, well, I read her comment at the beginning of this. I wish I could find it again. Um, oh, okay, hold on. Let me pull it up. Because I want you guys to think about what I just read, and I want you now to listen to Kenya from Cali's, okay? Kenya said, I had an epiphany about four years ago. I was driving through a rundown, quote unquote, ghetto part of Atlanta as I observed our people hanging out at the corner store, selling all manner of illicit drugs to their neighbor, dropping food bags and chicken bones on the ground as they walked. As I watched some middle-aged brothers sit and squander on the stoops of an abandoned home, as I watched black men and women's bodies riddled with all matter of disease and trauma, I realized there was in fact dissimilarity between me and the despair I was seeing. In our recent history, some of us have literally been bred to be comfortable living like animals, like literally bred with the runt of the litter for specific purposes that were beyond my knowing. None of this is an accident. I ask you, did that not remind you of the slave's firsthand account of a plantation, a rice plantation? where they kept slaves in mass to mine those fields? Did that not remind you of the field slave condition that I just read from that bond woman's narrative, from that slave's account of slavery in the plantation that she was living on? So I just, I wanna say this. I feel like these conversations make us uncomfortable. We use words, right, in our in our culture, because yesterday we were talking about culture. In our African American culture, we use words like bougie, high sadity, stuck up, right? We use words like that to describe people. And normally their greatest fault or talking white or things like that. We use words like that to describe people who push back against a lifestyle that mimics or refuse to partake and want something better for themselves than what has historically been offered to our people in this country which is to be bottom of the barrel, which is to live in those huts riddled with disease where nobody cares what happens to them. 
to be the most menial of the menial of humanity. How is it that Kenya wrote something in 2019 that mirrors something that was written by a slave? I heard Kenya's words and it immediately made me go to my bookshelf and pick up this book of a slave's accounts because in Kenya's words, it reminded me of what I had read that a slave wrote. Y'all, are we not gonna talk about this? Because it makes us, yes, fighting over scraps, Kenya. Fighting over scraps. That is literally, Kenya, when I read your comment, I literally thought of this book. I literally went and grabbed the Bond Woman's narrative and cracked it open. I tore through this book trying to find, I was like, I know that I read this in a firsthand account of a slave. I know that I've heard this sentiment before. We have to think when a woman in 2019 can write something that is so similar to a slave, what a slave wrote about the condition of field slaves. You think these two things are not attached? These things are connected. And then, you know, Dark Prophet was saying, so many of us feel some kind of way when people try to detach themselves from that existence. They are ostracized, they are treated well. You're trying to be white. We had a brother talking about accessing whiteness. Man, this mentality is deep. When we talk about accessing whiteness, we even perceive that affluence and a high position in society is accessing whiteness, not accessing affluence, not accessing power, not accessing resources. We will use the term accessing whiteness. I've heard Yvette Carnell use this term, accessing whiteness. We don't know how deep this is, I tell you, I'm not even ready to do the live on this yet, but Kenya, you provoked me because your words sounded like the words of a slave, a slave who observed field slaves, a slave who was not bred for the field. First encountering real field slaves was like, my goodness, how are they even alive in these conditions? That woman, those words I read, she was educated enough to write that herself. We know that the average slave did not have that level of knowledge. This, we're talking about two different types of slaves that were bred for two different things. One who is literate and bred for white companionship on one side, observing slaves that were bred to do nothing but till rice. And she was disgusted. If I kept reading, she would go on to talk about the injustice of that. But then we see the same dichotomy today. Would we be, would, would it be, would we be lying? Would it, would it be disingenuous for us to say that there are people she talked about in that book, that firsthand slave account, she talked about that the squalor was so great that these people were on top of each other in abject filth and poverty, and yet they were having sex everywhere somehow. They were heavily promiscuous, she said, somehow. Y'all, are we ready for these conversations? I ask you, are we, are we really ready to start having these conversations today? Because, you know, we don't like to be self-critical. We don't like to be self-critical. 
I don't, I don't know that we're ready for this. You guys, as I read about slave breeding practices, and it's not easy to find out about slave breeding practices because the breeders didn't want to share. But I am telling you when a sister in 2019 can, can pin down words of what she observed that mirror what a sister in slavery time says that she saw, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves about how some of our behaviors and attitudes, we may have to look at those with a closer microscope. Because for hundreds of years, whether we like to talk about this or not, for hundreds of years, our people were specifically bred to be a certain way. Bred. I have a book. I have historical documents sitting in my home. You guys know that I collect antiquarian books. I have a historical document sitting in my home that I just read to you. You don't have to take my word out for it. Go, go buy a copy for yourself. This, this is out there. A document that talks about a woman who was a slave where she, a firsthand account from her, where she talks about how she was bred. And she talks in that book about the breeding of many different types of slaves. Most of her encounters were with slaves that were bred for the purposes she was bred for which is white companionship. But she also talks about as she was sold from master to master, what she saw. And this woman talks about plantations that were just filled with filled slaves. So many slaves that if a slave broke their arm or leg, nobody cared because it was just that many slaves there. And how comfortable these people were being in squalor and filth. how they had sex and they were on top of each other. She talks about them doing harm to each other. Y'all, are we gonna pretend I don't know, but Kenya, I have to say that when I read your comment, you know, we had a brother, I believe it was a brother, who was like, does this not seem a tad bit condescending? And it did, honestly. What Kenya wrote was so raw that it is offensive. It is offensive. But sometimes the truth is offensive. Thank you. Kenya said we say chattel. We don't even know what that really means. We don't even fully realize what it chattel slavery really was. I, I'm telling you, this must be a conversation we need to have because Cynthia brought it up yesterday. Kenya brought it up today. I literally just happened to have a historical document in my house with a firsthand account from a slave that speaks on the very same thing. Y'all, I've been researching this and this live is not to get into it because I want to research it more. I am just saying that. The day that somebody in 2019 can say something almost exactly like a slave said about our people during slavery, we need to stop and say, "This is this just a coincidence? Are these behaviors and mindsets and this ability to be comfortable in the most abject of situations, is that a, con is that a coincidence? Or do we need to start having some uncomfortable conversations about how our culture as black people, some of the toxic behaviors in our culture may be literally rooted in chattel slavery and the literal breeding of people. That there is a difference. We could tie this into that white doctor who talked about W.E.D. Du Bois and he was like, there's a certain group of blacks who are capable of reaching a level of intellect and a certain group who are not. That is an offensive statement. But this white man was also talking from a position and a point in time where they knew that for hundreds of years they had bred our people to be a certain way. 
And so it was beyond them to comprehend that those that had been bred to work in the rice fields and live in huts crawling with disease and vermin and sleeping on hay. And that historical document I just read, that sister, that slave, she said they slept on hay, riddled with vermin, packed tight into huts that were filthy, that to the point that they were so dilapidated, they would fall down. And if a head were crushed on a slave or a leg were broken, nobody cared because they had that many bodies to work those fields. These people were having sex with no care for their own condition. That is an uncomfortable thing to hear coming from an actual slave. But what is more uncomfortable is when somebody in 2019 can make a comment in the comment section on YouTube that mirrors what an actual slave wrote about our people hundreds of years ago. We have to talk about this. How much of what's going on, how much of our passivity, how much of what we are is tied to hundreds of years of reading? I am telling you, Cynthia brought it up yesterday. Kenya brought it up today. When Cynthia brought it up yesterday, I didn't even think about the fact that I had this book in my library. I didn't even think about it. But when Kenya gave such a vivid account, her words reminded me of the words of a slave who wrote what she saw. And I thought, wow. Kenya literally sounds like what I read, this firsthand account of a slave. She's literally saying the same thing as this slave was saying. It would behoove us to not investigate this. We don't want to be offended. And if you try to call it out, People will say, you are being bougie, you are being high sedity, you are being stuck up. You think you're better than somebody. No, maybe we just need to call out the behavior for what it is so that we can change our culture and undo some of these chains, these literal chains that our people are wearing because of hundreds of years of intentional breeding. This is just a thought. But Kenya, yeah, I'm not going to stay up here forever, you guys. I'm not going to stay up here forever, you guys. But honestly, Kenya, I am so glad that you wrote that comment because your comment was offensive. It was offensive. But had you not written that comment, I would not have remembered that I've read a document written by a slave that says the same thing. And I'm going to continue researching this because, like I said, ever since Cynthia mentioned it yesterday, I have been reading about slave breeding practices. And we might have to have this conversation, y'all. She said they were heavily promiscuous. And today, the Black community has the highest rates of sexually transmitted diseases because we are the most promiscuous people behind only gay men. I do not say this to be down on Black people. I say this because I love our people. And if we do not have these conversations, if we do not look at a slave talking about how in squalor, on a rice plantation in filth sleeping on straw, these people were heavily promiscuous. And we see nothing about how most of our people throughout the diaspora are poor, dirt poor, and heavily promiscuous. Y'all, the correlations of it all. That they did not even seem to care about their own squalor that they hated those that had been bred to not be in the field, that there was a division there. This is what this woman talks about, this slave talks about in her firsthand account of our slavery. And how does that sound so similar to what we have today? How do we have the same dynamic today in 2019, y'all? We need to ask ourselves this.
That is scary. Kenya, it gave me chills too. When I read what you wrote, it gave me chills. I literally had to go to my upstairs bookshelf and pull this book out. And I was tearing through this book because I was like, I know that I read this somewhere in this document. I had to find the page where I read it so that I could read it to you guys to show you that this thing might be more real than we think. We might have to have some strong conversations because. What will we need to do to overcome that level of consistency in our behavior and our mindset? I, I don't know. I, I can't even, like, I, it's, it's a lot for me to process, y'all. I'm just trying to process it. I was just so taken aback with Kenya's comment. And then when I read the response to her comment, which was that, isn't this a little bit condescending? Like, aren't you talking trash about our people right now? And then I had to go look at that historical document and I was like, Kenya has literally said the same thing that a slave said about us, about what she observed there. I had to think, I, I literally, y'all, it's overwhelming. It's literally overwhelming. I'm overwhelmed. I don't even know what to say. I am personally going to keep researching this. But I have to say, because other people will read her comment, let us not try to be offended when somebody is blatantly honest. And an observation about our community, because the thing that we really have to do is we have to be introspective or we can never correct these behaviors. Yesterday, we were talking about culture. How will we correct the things wrong in our culture? If we, if it's so uncomfortable for us to have these conversations, and people have to be fearful about being honest in these conversations because that honesty kind of rubs us the wrong way. It's a little too much truth. Bella Donna said, I thought Black people knew that's how it was on these plantations. Bella... I'm sorry, Belle, I don't know that they did, Belle. We say chattel slavery. We say, you know, she's right. We're used to seeing, Belle, you are right. We are used to seeing a romanticized view of slavery. We're used to seeing movie views of slavery. I, I strongly advise you guys all get Bond Woman's narrative because that just really puts in perspective actual slavery, a, a, a slave woman writing about being bought and sold and what she saw and the varying types of slavery that she experienced really puts it into perspective. We hate the mulatto, we hate the quadroon, but do you know she talks about the account of a mulatto or an octoroon who was so mentally stressed by the idea of becoming somebody else's whore that the woman dropped dead. And when she was sold, the person buying her said, I thought you had two. I thought you had two of these winches. And he said, one of them is dead. He said, did she have a disease? He said, no, but you know, these ones die easily. The ones bred for sex die easily. They don't have the hardiness of the field slaves. This is in this woman's account. And on the other hand, you have the field slaves so hardy in body that they could sleep on hay, on hay at a rice, on a, on a rice plantation with bugs, having sex with each other in crowded huts, fighting each other for food. And they were bred that way for hundreds of years. We must talk about this. We must talk about how 
Kenya was able to write about how she felt driving through the ghetto and what she observed there and how what she wrote about what she observed just two years ago matches so perfectly with what a slave woman observed at a rice plantation during slavery. And we have her firsthand written account of what she saw as a slave. It is just, I'm so overwhelmed with how deep this is. We're going to have to put on our big kid underwear and not be offended at the truth, or we are not going to correct ourselves. We are assimilating white Greco-Roman culture, and at the same time, we are suffering from the literal effects and mentality and passivity and comfortableness with, you know, degrading and disgusting behavior and vile living conditions. But this is all happening for a reason. And we might have to start having some real conversations about that. I think the all signs are pointing to it. Because like I said, Sin mentioned it yesterday. Kenya mentioned it. Everybody's bringing it up. But we might have to merge these thought processes together and really address this. Sharice said when Holly Berry played queen, um, it showed the difference of the house slaves and the field slaves. That's true, but let's not forget that queen was also based on a firsthand account. Um, I would advise Bond Woman's narrative be in everybody's book collection. That that is it is not a book. It was a collection of writings that a former slave wrote. They were auctioned off out of a private collection of somebody that collected antiquarian slavery writings and it was published as she wrote it and it's worth a read but i also y'all it's going to be coming i, I really want to have this conversation when i do more research about slave breeding practices because i think we need to talk about how for hundreds of hundreds of years our people were bred cynthia brought this up yesterday but i think this you know, we say this in passing, but I don't think we appreciate that breeding does work. You can breed a certain type. And how does this apply to us today? We need to be able to separate what is truly us and what we desire from what we are inclined to do because of our genetics. I don't know. It's, it's such an uncomfortable conversation, y'all. This is such an uncomfortable conversation. I feel very uncomfortable. But I think it's something that we, we need to discuss honestly. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Let's just, um, let's just go ahead and I'm just going to end this now. But I do want to revisit this conversation when I have lots of historical documents to share with you guys. Because after Cynthia brought it up, I definitely looked at this. But I just want to thank Kenya because you guys are so inspirational. Kenya, had you not been so raw and open and transparent with your comment, even though it was very offensive what you wrote, it was offensive, but it was true. 
And your you being that honest, it reminded me that I had read something like that somewhere before. And I read it from what a slave wrote. And I just think it is so profound that you, a woman in 2019, could write down words that mimic what a slave wrote in her observations about our people. That is just mind blowing. And that's why I always say like on this channel, it's like really a two way dialogue because you guys outnumber me and bring far more to the table. But this is a conversation that we're having because y'all know I read every single comment, right? It's a conversation that we are having and together we are gonna navigate this thing. Midtown said it's not an uncomfortable conversation. It's a needed conversation. It is a needed conversation. Anyway, y'all, I'm going to go. But that's just, I don't know. Like, my mind was just blown. And I just, I wanted to come on here and just talk about it. But I want to revisit this. You guys do your research. I'm going to be doing my research. Let's convene here again and just really, really address this from a factual historical standpoint and compare that to what we are doing now so that we can undo the harm that was done to our people. We need to be just as methodical in unwrapping these kinds of chains in our community as they were in placing them on us. I think that is really what needs to happen. So, um, yeah, you guys, I will, um, I'll talk to you guys later. Um, yeah, I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs>